Howdy, how you going? Uh, sorry it's been a while since I've talked on Live Strider. Um, it's uh, just been sort of put into second priority from the main channel Phantom Strider for a few months. and uh, But I wanted to do a commentary because I honestly really enjoy these. And I enjoy talking with a close community of you because, you know, I feel like we're among friends here. You know, it's a much closer-knit community and that's, that's really cool to me. And it's actually what gives me the most drive to uh, kind of keep doing this. And... Anyway, I decided, I was thinking, what list should I talk about? And I thought, uh, Darkest Adult Cartoon Episodes is one I actually have looked back on a couple of times because, to me, the things that were said were really important. I really got to share a very close piece of myself with the world in this video. And even if it isn't looked back on that often by people, just the fact that so many people were able to kind of take this message on board really meant the world to me because uh, I really do believe a lot of what I said here from the bottom of my heart, you know, whether it be about existentialism and my view on the universe and how we perceive the world. Um, you know, obviously this Nutshack stuff is just uh, a kind of... I probably shouldn't have put Nutshack first because it wasn't... I don't even know if I should have bothered putting Nutshack on because it's so... It didn't really contribute much. It's just sort of like a, uh, a comedic filler to start off with, but... Uh, I think I was struggling with uh, one to put on the list, and I wanted to put something that's technically uh, for adults uh, on the list, so I put on the slasher episode of Nutshack, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know if you could even call it dark, because it's not really, it's just kind of technically Halloween, so of the ones I put on the list, this is probably the one I regret the most putting on the list, but at the same time, it's, yeah, it's dark, you know, because it's, it's using sort of horror themes and that sort of thing, and I certainly wouldn't be showing it to kids. But um, yeah, as you've probably seen, I don't know if you, I don't know if you have seen, but I talked about this show on the worst cartoons of all time, and uh, um, it, it really is like offensive in every way, and just uh, the even the animation's quite unpleasant, and uh, there's really very little to say about it in terms of. Um, you know, what it contributes, because it really contributes nothing. The only thing I like about it is the, uh, the woman on it. I think she's kind of nice. The, uh, one, she's like, she actually seems like a more fleshed out human being than a lot of the other characters, you know, when she talks and stuff. So it's, uh, you know, I, I find it a bit more interesting because of her, but <laughs> that, that being said, you know, there's a really offensive, like, stereotype, and the, the guy we get uh, earlier on in this episode is just like, ah, uh, you know, less said about that show, the better. But Homer's Enemy, I do have a lot to say about. Um, in that, uh, I got a lot of interesting feedback on this episode in saying, like, uh, and I probably did analyze it wrong in some ways in my assumption of what it says. Some people say, you know, I kind of said, does it say that uh, some people are just going to suffer in the world? But other people kind of say that maybe it's just leave well enough alone because, you know, don't pick at someone who does well, or even if it doesn't seem right, you know, just accept what you have and do the best you can with what you have. And I don't know, I, I guess in my, I would personally kind of take the Buddhist philosophy in this case where I would say that um, even if uh, Frank's life is suffering, you know, he should try and find the best in what he has and look for the best in it rather than being bitter and angry. But it's a situation where you can't really blame him and I think that's what makes it so dark is that you can understand his frustration and anger and that he's never really had a break in life. But, you know, the, interestingly, I think this is actually considered um, uh, the favorite episode. I think I mentioned that actually, in the, uh, but it's actually the favorite episode of the creator of The Simpsons, Matt Groening. And I, n I never understood really why, but, uh, oh, geez, I had a little bit of flashing there. I should have got rid of that. Sorry. Um, but uh, it's actually also, as well as that, I think it's also the favorite episode of um, like that one of the highest rated IMDb episodes. And I, I never quite got that because like, I get that it's kind of saying something, but it's 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 not fun or pleasant. It's not an episode I continually rewatch, that's for certain. It's just kind of, I'm not gonna call it mean spirited, but it's a, a very ugly message. And a, But I'm glad it is there because I think it's an important message to say that, you know, some people, are gonna have it tough, you know, and at least makes you pre appreciative of the things you do have, you know, and uh, the good things we do have. And uh, yeah, this one um, is talking about anorexia and American Dad, the after-school special, and 
Interestingly, even when I watched the entire series of American Dead, I think this and the spy episodes are the two episodes I kind of remember really succinctly, very distinctly. This is about the only time I've ever seen, I think I mentioned, um, uh, anorexia kind of covered in the media in a very honest way, um, certainly in animation. Um, because, uh, you know, I think I've mentioned it before, but I have some obsessive compulsive tendencies, you know, and I can get very obsessive about my exercise and stuff. And, you know, you never want to go to this extreme. And the thing about uh, things like anorexia and exercise bulimia and that sort of thing is it's a very slippery slope in that, you know, suddenly people are looking at themselves in the mirror every day and hating themselves. And you visually do start to see fat on you and that sort of thing and start to see yourself as ugly, um, even when you aren't necessarily ugly and that sort of thing. And the fact is you associate fat with ugly, which certainly isn't the case, um, in my opinion, you know. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very funny psychological phenomenon that um, very much does happen. And even though it's a small percentage of the population, you know, it's like, uh, I mean, technically, breast cancer is much uh, lower than bladder cancer, but that doesn't mean that we don't talk about uh, breast cancer a lot. So, um, you know, I think it doesn't make it any less important. Um, so, yeah, I've... Uh, and it certainly shows as well that uh, um, it's not an attractive thing to see. Like now, personally, whenever I see a lady or a man on the street who is... Uh, or in the shops or something that obviously does have an eating disorder and it's like got really thin arms and stuff, you know, it certainly doesn't look attractive. Even supermodels and stuff, you know, I think it doesn't look attractive or healthy. And I wonder... I don't think many people do think that looks attractive and healthy to be that uh, dangerously thin to the point where you're obviously mostly just eating steamed vegetables or obsessively exercising. And I guess it's because I've got past experience because I see the pain and I see the kind of restriction when I um, when I see those people. Of course it starts. I'm sorry. A buzzsaw just started. Um, I'm just going to turn that off. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Uh, just... Uh, um, uh, Buzzsaw started out there. So anyway, uh, Rick and Morty, this one is probably the one I remember the most because uh, it's really, I, I really wanted to address and I spent probably two and a half minutes instead of two minutes, which I try to keep everything two minutes as you probably know, um, talking about this one, but I really wanted to talk about how I don't agree with that kind of nihilistic uh, viewpoint um, you know, and it, it, I don't know, to me, a lot of the time, Rick and Morty just seems like an edgy teenager who's just only now kind of discovering these thoughts. And But I think as well, I feel less angry about it when I thought about it because I realized that atheism is so rare and just having that, like, a lot of the world does kind of give themselves e the easy answers. And I like that I realized that Rick and Morty is an outlet for people that perhaps have been told everything is under God and that, you know, everyone has a plan and a purpose and that um, all that other sort of stuff and that God loves everyone and that sort of thing. And I realized that Rick and Morty is an outlet to that. So even if I don't like how ruthlessly nihilistic it is and kind of immaturely and lazily so, because I believe that um, Rick is a hedonist. I mean, that's the best way to put him. He just takes pleasure in everything because he can't decide to personally take meaning in something. And that's why I really like to promote uh, secular humanism because uh, we choose in humanism to take meaning in relationships and the things we have here on the earth and cherish them in this moment now. And I think it's the most important message I actually deliver in this, in my opinion, anyway, you know, and I don't mean to sound all artsy, oh, it's such an important message, but personally, like, if there's anything I could give to the world, it's that message that we choose whether to take meaning in something. And I love the fact that we kind of can compare it to Bojack and that Bojack does uh, kind of have a similar viewpoint, yet at the same time, it's not what we kind of focus and concentrate on. It doesn't, like, he wants to be happy. He wants to find joy in this life. And I I think that's so much more admirable, the message that Bojack gives, uh, if you know what I mean. I apologize if I was a bit vague on that concept, but I guess it's really important stuff to me, but also very abstract when you're sort of talking about essentially the meaning of life, <laughs> the meaning of what your life is to you. 
and both the shows kind of go into that they just throw it on the table and i love that i love that about adult cartoon shows sometimes is that they can be upfront about what meaning we get from our existence and you know i really wanted to drive that home and even if it went over 50 percent of people's heads or they didn't care like i know it isn't interesting to everyone but uh I think that stuff's important, you know, and it's something a lot of us think about at least once in our life. And Screams of Silence, you know, um... It's certainly not a good episode, and some people also appreciated that I showed both men and women statistic in that, because I understand that, um... While both sides certainly can be abused, uh, the generally the tendency is to talk about the women's side, and while there is a larger statistic in the amount of women abused, I think it's very important to talk about both sides, you know, to say it's an, because it's very easy to feel demonized or attacked when it comes to these sort of subjects, and I think the people who, um, you know, say, well, what about the men? They're not necessarily downplaying the fact that women are hurt as well, that they're, they're feeling attacked or like they, they as men are demonized. And I think I understand and empathize with both both sides on the subject because, um, you know, I've known people in both, uh, both sides and, you know, both can be victims. Uh, I'm not talking about the people who are actually abusers. I'm talking about the people, both men and women that are abused. And yeah, again, apologies if I went a bit vague on that one, but there's, I guess, that's what this uh, list does to me. It's uh, talking about very vague concepts, and it just tends to do that to me. Anyway, Pygmalion. Um, Alpha talked about this one first, and uh, yeah, he really covered it well, um, I think, in that he gave it a really good analysis, and it's interesting because there isn't any real outright violence and it doesn't feel like there's many dark concepts being talked about but i think i say it here as well that the thing about king of the hell is it feels uncomfortably real at times there is something about it um where you know you just take it more seriously because i don't know when when you see um the king of the hell family they feel like when you see Peggy, it feels like a real middle-aged lady, you know, trying to protect her uh, niece or so on and so forth. This feels like a real crazy man who um, is having an emotional breakdown. And it, it really blurs the lines of reality better than... And I think that's partially why I don't, um, don't enjoy it as much. Um, because, I don't know, it isn't as much of a... No, but you could argue that for Bojack as well. But there's a sense of kind of um silliness with bojack it knows to uh um kind of have the jokes in and i guess it, it almost feels like a sitcom it's, that's what it is it's an animated sitcom it's not a comedy and i guess when you see something like the simpsons you kind of expect comedy um a kind of element of comedy more of an element of silliness to animation like bojack and simpsons does because um because it's animation, we kind of make that assumption, but King of the Hill doesn't have that, and people really appreciated that, I think, growing up, that it was kind of just an animated sitcom. But uh, I, it was also the animation. I never really got into the animation myself either. It's just uh, that's something ugly about the animation that I can never really get on board with. And obviously, I haven't talked much about the scene itself, but yeah, um, as Alpha and myself said in the original review, it's it's an ugly, ugly scene, and it feels real, and that's it feels dirty and that sort of thing, and it, it really gets the ambience right. And I, you know, it's um, I would actually, in some ways, call it uh, uh, creepier than some of the other earlier ones on this list because um, just for that couple of scenes, because it feels like a real somewhat abusive encounter here that he's slowly being uh, uh, crept her into an abusive relationship and it's uh, it's all done very well so yeah and moral oral another one which is creepily real at times and um oh yeah what do you say about moral oral um the thing is is that uh, which i like is that oral is a very likable character he is a character that you don't hate because he believes in Jesus or anything like that. He's just trying to do his best. And the footage I actually used there, um, you can see of him meditating, 
He essentially converts to Buddhism, which I think is so cool, because um, I'm technically secular humanist slash partially Buddhist as well. And I love that he uses meditation to kind of hide um, the fact that he, like, he's not praying and that sort of thing. And that he starts to kind of see, because this whole town is so, so conservative, Catholic, uh, um, charismatic Christian. It's, it's stuff that I've uncomfortably seen before. And I think a lot of us have seen before from the Jehovah's Witnesses to... Um, every so on and so forth that can really be forceful and it can mess kids up and I love the fact that we kind of see the personal journey of Oral and how he overcomes this and we talk about a lot of things in this episode that are so uncomfortable in terms of like this is the only time I've really seen a person in the quiet in the dark dealing with their obsessive compulsive symptoms and I noticed in the comments a lot of other not a lot of other people but a few other people commented when they saw that latching of the door oh oh it's very real and as someone who struggled with that sort of thing um in the past and present uh it really gets you um and i think that's what it's for it's for um raising awareness and showing that you know this happens to other people and it's um you know it's not just you and i think that normalizing things and just showing that uh, it's a real problem to other people just makes it a little easier, you know, I think. Um, so, I don't know um, about how I think we can get through things is seeing other people go through it. Anyway, yeah, um, and obviously we talk about a lot of other subjects here, such as, um, well, I, I don't think I need to explain the coat hanger on the desk and what that signifies. Um, I was surprised I didn't get censored, but actually... Um, but uh, it, it's a very important topic, and I think YouTube does recognize that sometimes, sometimes, when there's an important topic to be discussed and when there's actual artistic value to that, what's being discussed. And there's no artistic value to this, by the way. Um, uh, that's why I censored everything, because it's like, you don't need to see this. And people actually thank me in the comments for censoring it all, because, and I like that, no one, uh, very few people nowadays are just like, oh, why'd you censor it? Uh, and because no one wants to see, you know, the bloody corpses and mutilated faces of um, the Mr. Pickles crew, you know, there's, there's, there's no value in it. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, and a lot of people pointed out that there's, you could have pretty much picked any <laughs> Mr. Pickles episode and each one is almost as bad as the last. But there's something I think to be said about medical horror. Um, uh, some generations are affected more than others, um, but I've certainly found in my generation anyway, from the people I know, the idea of a doctor trying to, you know, treat you, like trying to do harm you or something like that can be scarier than, you know, uh, a lunatic trying to do something to you because you place a trust in a doctor. And I think um, it again sort of touches on real horror when we get into people we trust turning on us and... Uh, um, yeah, of course, drawn together, which, again, any, I was really stuck on which one to choose for this one. The other choice I was thinking of is the episode where, um, uh, Captain Hero does the AIDS walk. And you may notice, I, just to be on the safe side, I, um, because you can see, uh, Foxy's, um, wobbly bits, uh, ends through the, um, through her cloth, I decided to um, yeah, put down censoring there just to be safe. And I think I missed censoring there on her anyway, so it, like maybe there was no points. I was like, oh no, I saw... Uh, uh, well, I think I can say nipple. I can say nipples, can't I? I saw nipples, oh no, my childhood is ruined. Uh, you know, I don't think, obviously, I don't think that's the case. I'm just more... I wanted people to be able to see this. And it, um, if you've seen what happened to my uh, worst uh, anime of all time, YouTube absolutely buries something if it becomes adults only, if they have to flag it as adults only. So, um, yeah, I just did my best to cover up everything. You know, even that footage there, we can see um, the dog's brain. I'm <laughs> just like, Jesus. It's hard to cover all the bases with uh, drawn together. And that's actually the mo uh, part of uh, the heavy effort I put into this. I think James and Taylor, aka Toongrin and Time Lord, and Thomas, um, 
uh, they all helped me edit this one and the most effort I had to put in kind of re-editing and tweaking. I always go through and retweak and edit parts when they do it just to make it up to what I'd like. And they do massive amount for me. I'm so grateful though. Um, the most work I did was censoring their stuff. Anyway, I'm getting way off track and we've moved on to Castlevania. Um, yeah, Castlevania, as I've mentioned in Invest Netflix uh, tunes, is just unbelievable. It's really taken uh, Netflix animation by storm and it's certainly the best video game cartoon I've ever seen. A lot of people mentioned I should have used this Rick and Morty episode instead, Rick po Potion Number 9, and that's perfectly fair argument. Um, arguably the most traumatic event that ever occurs to uh, Morty happens here, so it's um, certainly a contester. Um, I could have cho chosen either, but I think autoerotic assimilation, the idea of a questioning free will and the value of free will, to me that's a very dark concept. And South Park episode 200 and 201, of course. Um, this one I've talked about before, but I tend to shy away from talking about nowadays because uh, I tend to find I get more sensor issues if I do even talk about this episode. In fact, uh, I think I mentioned it before, but um, Matt and Trey actually did a commentary for this one. And they basically said this, that, okay, anything we say about this will probably get censored. But what I think we can say is, beep, and it just goes on like that. And you think it's a joke, but everything they say about it gets censored. Um, and here, of course, is what I consider the, uh, yeah, the darkest adult cartoon episode I've ever seen. It's still an episode I really struggle to watch. Like, I don't, I, I hesitated on some of the footage I put in here because it is so so dark to me, so black pitch, some of the things sort of talked about here. And obviously the episode where um, in season five where Bojack kind of, his perceptions change so much that he ends up strangling. Um, oh my God, I've forgotten her name, not Caitlin. Um, uh, anyway, uh, his uh, new girlfriend, uh, Gina, Gina, that was it, Gina. Um, and that's obviously a really dark one as well, but uh, yeah, the, both of them really uh, affected me quite heavily. This one, though, in particular affected me, and I think uh, uh, dementia is a very serious issue right now. And as I was saying in the episode, I think we're in an age right now, and we talk about everything in this episode, uh, like we even address lobotomy and that sort of thing, and essentially the root of... Um, the trauma and one thing I didn't talk about as much as I'd like to so much was cut out of this one because I talked for like four minutes originally on this episode but generational trauma I think is a really interesting part of what we can see through Bojack and I think that's the most powerful message that comes one of the most powerful messages that comes through Bojack is that we can see that the the trauma that was caused by the effect of his grandmother being lobotomized is something that has carried through the generations and affected Bojack, which I think, you know, a hundred years almost of uh, an effect. God, I had too many flashes in this one. I apologize for that. Um, I, I wouldn't normally let these pass. Um, but uh, there's something to be said about that. And I think we can see that in indigenous communities in both America and Australia and uh, Indian communities. Um, people like who have been affected like maybe a hundred years ago but a human lifetime you know we sort of say in, a, in one human lifetimes we sort of think oh get over it or something like that but actual generational trauma can take decades to hundreds of years for people to move past completely and they'll try each generation will try but sometimes it is hard for people to completely overcome the past abuse of previous trauma um, of previous generations. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I think it it really is worth, I can empathize and say that's a very real thing. Um, and it really makes me think about generational trauma, this one. That's like the number one thing I end up thinking about with that episode is how one event or a couple of events can affect like a hundred years in the future. And I think that is so amazing and interesting. And Final Space is another one I didn't talk about because it's so damn meta. We've got that stupid hero at the start um, who's always saying, oh yeah, like, ah, oh, I won't talk about that one. It's like, I think it's too meta though. Most important to me though is, um, I think that's a really important quote what uh, Bojack says at the end there. And uh, 
I've sort of developed the habit of juggling at the end of every video, and uh, yeah, I, it's just a nice thing I like to do because I don't put myself in live action as much nowadays, and it's not something anyone beyond my close friends has really complained about that much, but anyway, you know, I think more important is the content itself. Anyway, uh, that's all for the video today, and thanks very much for tuning in. Uh, I'll uh, talk to you later.